Have your Bibles. I'm going to be looking in Ephesians. We're going to look in Ephesians. I want to welcome everybody. If you're a guest tonight, thank you so much for coming out, being a part of, uh, of our service tonight. We want to welcome all of our regular attenders, all those who come, and we thank you so much. Also, we want to welcome our video campus uh, in Dallas, as well as those watching online, Roku Television, and those listening by radio. Christ Central, welcome them all into our service tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. It's, it's great to be here. In our last service, I was teaching on the mind. I taught on the mind. How many of you were here when I taught on the mind? Amen. And we talked about the double-mindedness that the Bible refers to and how that is part of the strategies of the enemy to pull us away from the things of God. That we know that we're three-part beings. We're body, soul, and spirit. And the spirit part is the part that is born again uh, when God renews us and we receive Christ. And it's the part that God speaks to. God is spirit. And uh, those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so God deals with our spirit, even though he ministers to our body and to our mind, our soul. But he speaks to our spirit because God is spirit. And we know that the, uh, the enemy, the devil, deals with our flesh. The Bible talks about how that our, our flesh is carnal. And that uh, Paul made reference that there's nothing good in our flesh. That we are self-centered and, and we are not God-conscious in our flesh. It's our spirit that is God conscience. And so God is saying that when we get saved, that our spirit man is born again, and that then we are to begin to read the Bible, we're begin to pray, let God speak to us, and then He renews our mind. It gives us, and we're trying to get the mind of Christ. That way we are acting, and our values are like Christ, our attitudes are like Christ, our, our, uh, our, our heartbeat is like Christ. That's why it talks about that God is trying to grow Christ in us, mature. Christ in us, a Christian that is mature, that we are built in the image of Christ, that uh, we the full stature or the maturity of Christ has come into us, and that we are reacting as Christ would react, and that we're thinking as Christ would think. But the enemy does not want us thinking in maturity or operating in maturity, so he takes the flesh and tempts us to begin to do things that are contrary to the Word of God and to the relationship with God, and he causes us to get so carnal minded that we're not uh, in a relationship with God trying to pull us out of that fellowship with God so there's a war and uh, and you've heard me say Joyce Meyer has that book the battlefield of the mind because that war happens in the mind or the soul which is the will the intellect the emotions of a man and so that's where the battle is happening but what we talked about is how the spirit man must be fed and must be strengthened and to do that you've got to have a hunger for maturity and maturity means there needs to be, you need to be a self-feeder. And what I mean by that is it's wonderful you come to the church and you are taught the Word of God. That's part of what the Scripture talks about. This is a place of equipping. We're going to talk about that. It's a place of teaching and growing and development and discovery and all those kind of things. But you also need to also be having your own feeding times in the Spirit where you're reading the Bible for yourselves and you're praying on your own and you're worshiping God in, the, in your own way. And in that, you'll, you'll, you'll accelerate your growth. And so what I'm talking about tonight, I'm going to be probably teaching for a little while. I'm going to be talking about the road to spiritual maturity. And it's going to be uh, kind of basic as we talk about some things because I believe that people have to make up their mind that they want to pursue a closer relationship with God. And they have to make up their mind that they want to pursue maturity in God. But it takes a conscious decision. And that's what we talked about. You've got to make a decision that I'm not just going to uh, uh, lounge around or take it easy, but I'm going to get hungry for God because you're not going to end up in a place of maturity just because you come up here and I pray for you or we put a little oil on you. All of a sudden, you don't become some spiritual giant overnight. Come on, somebody. Amen. A lot of times you come up and it's wonderful. We pray and that's part of what God talks about. But if you think that that's going to impart you with spiritual maturity, it is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It is a process of making a decision to follow God. And there are roads and paths that God uses to grow us all. And in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm just going to read a few verses and then we're going to talk about it for a little bit. Uh, and it talks about in the scripture, it talks about the fivefold gifts, the ascension gifts uh, of, the, of the ministry. And here's what it says, starting in verse 11. Now, these are the gifts of the, uh, that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now, listen to this. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church 
and the body of Christ. I, I got more to read, but I got to go back and read that again. Their responsibility, the pastors, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, uh, all of those, it, their responsibility is to equip God's people. Turn to somebody and say, I think he's talking to you. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and the complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Somebody say in love. Growing in every way and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work and it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. In other words, what, I, what the scripture talks about, there's a lot there, but what he's talking about is that everybody has a part to play in ministry. There is not just a few people doing ministry and the rest of the people are on the sidelines watching and spectating. And there's not a few people doing ministry and a few people in Monday morning quarterbacking. Come on, how many of you know Monday morning quarterbacking? Amen. Those are the ones who sit on the couch and eat the potato chips and talk about if I was that pro athlete, I'd do it a little different. Come on. <laughs> Come on, amen. Uh, and and the, the Bible doesn't really teach us that in this life that there is a spectator place or position in the body of Christ. It does talk about that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, but those have gone on before us and they're dead. Come on, somebody. In the body of Christ, if you've got a pulse and you've got breath, you're in the game. You're not a spectator. You're not on the sidelines. You're not a Monday morning quarterback. Come on, somebody. Mm, high five and say, he's already getting good. He's already getting in some good stuff. Amen. You, you know, and he's talking about maturity and, he, and he's talking about immaturity. When he's talking about us getting mature, he's also talking about immaturity. And one of the things, I don't know, if, see, I'm not sure if you're a parent and you only have one child, I don't know if you really qualify as an official parent. And the reason I'm saying that is because you need numerous apple heads to deal with the variables of parenting. Come on. To try to figure out first off who's lying. Who did it? When you got one kid, there it is. But when you got three or four, you got the Sherlock Holmes sometimes. You got to break down the clues. You got to play good cop and bad cop with the wife. Come on. You go in there and then I'm coming back in right behind you. We're going to get to, the, is anybody here what I'm talking about? Amen. And, and they're blaming each other. He touched me. She touched me. They took that. They did that. And, and, the real, and what he's talking about is the Bible. He's talking about the church has to move in unity because when you don't have maturity in the body and you got a lot of immature Christians, everybody starts pointing a finger. Mm. Why, why am I always doing all the work and ain't nobody else over here helping me? And why didn't somebody do that? They just showing up and getting paid. They not doing this and they're not doing that. And, and my so-and-so, look what they're wearing. And I can't believe how they dress. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about? They butted in the coffee line. I was all ready to worship. Now I'm mad. My smoothie ain't smooth. What's wrong with this place? <laughs> Can I give you a word? Does God just give yes? Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Come on. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? Grow up. Grow up. Come on. We are the body of Christ. And the enemy wants to get our eyes off of what we're supposed to do and look at other people. It is one of his greatest strategies. You, you, when you have a, a child and, and you're, you're dealing with a child about a report card or, or cleaning their room, and you know when they're, when they're messing up because they'll want to talk about the other sibling. But dad, have you seen his room? I ain't talking about his room. He's next. I'm talking about your room. Come on, anybody hear what I'm talking about? 
Is it, and, and in the body of Christ, that's why he talks about that in the body of Christ, he said, I want you to grow. I want you to be mature. I, I want you to understand that, first of all, your responsibility is yourself. You worry about your relationship with me, and you worry about what you're supposed to be doing, and you do it out of a good heart. But don't worry about other people. That's not your responsibility. Come on, somebody. That I want you to run your race, and I want you to keep your head and your heart focused on what you're called to do. And, and we have to realize that when we discover how God has shaped us and gifted us and equipped us, uh, we will begin to mature and function in ministry. And it doesn't matter how gifted you are, if you're not mature, you're not ready to handle it. Is anybody hearing me? See, one of the worst things that happens in the body of Christ is a lot of guys will grab a hold of someone because they got a gift and they elevate them too much. And listen to me, gifted people without maturity will hurt people. I'll say that again. If you are gifted but you are not mature, you will hurt somebody. Come on, amen? And it's, it's the same thing in the body of Christ. We not only need gifts, but we need maturity to operate. But when you find it, when you find and discover your gift and you begin to operate in it and you begin to mature in the things of God, you will find fulfillment and you will also find fruitfulness because that's how God created you and that's how God shaped you is to serve in the body of Christ. The ministry at Christ Central is determined by a lot of factors. One is obviously the vision that God has given us in leadership, but it's also determined by the makeup and the shape of our congregation. The uniqueness of the vision is fueled by the uniqueness of the people and the giftedness and the anointings and the people that make up the body of believers. That we have certain things that God has given us to do and as we do them, we don't start them until God brings us the people who is anointed and gifted to do them. Is anybody here hearing me. In other words, and, and some of the easiest things that we can talk about is stuff like the assisted living for the elderly. I, uh, God gave us a vision for it and we began to do it. But if we did not have qualified people over there uh, uh, with nursing degrees and, and health degrees and dietary degrees, uh, we would be messing some people up. Come on, somebody. You don't want me passing out the pharmaceuticals. I guarantee you that. And we say, where's Uncle Ted? Uncle Ted swinging on the chandelier. I thought I gave him the right stuff. Come on, somebody. The, the reality is you can't do certain things if you don't have the qualified, gifted people to do it. Amen? And so that's what we're talking about. The vision will line up with the people that God brings. And then also, there's sometimes God drops a vision and we don't launch it because we don't have the people mature enough. Sometimes I've seen the gift, but the maturity is not ready to handle it, so we can't launch into it. And so we're talking about ministry denying. We're talking about the road to maturity. The goals of a ministry process, according to Scripture, you got to realize what I just read to you is he's talking about those fivefold gifts, those fivefold offices or functions in the body of Christ that pastors are administrators, they are teachers, and they are equippers, but people are also ministers. I want, you, I want you to get this in the kingdom because we, especially in our culture, it gets more and more twisted. And what's almost happened is we get this celebrity mentality. That we're going to come together and we're going to hear the best singers and we're going to hear some great communicators and they're the ministers and, and we're just a laity and, and we're not connected. But listen, you've got to understand that the church is not about celebrity. There's one celebrity and his name is Jesus. He's the King of Kings. Amen. And the gifts that any of us have that, are, that, are, uh, that, that move in the supernatural, it, it is not an individual gift. It's been given by God, so we can't take credit for it. It's been given by God. So if we sing with an anointing, it comes from God. If we communicate or preach with anointing, it comes from God. If we play an instrument, it's not about us being gifted. It's about a gift that God's given us, and he says he's given them for the whole body. And the thing that you have to understand is the gifts are not only on the platform. Literally, the Bible says that every person in a seat here tonight has been given a gift. This place is full of gifted people. High five somebody and say, you sitting by one. You sitting by one, dog. You are sitting by one. 
And, and, and what we have to understand is that the goal and the purpose of the church was for the equipping of the saints and then for the work of the ministry, then together we began to minister and we began to meet people's needs and we began to evangelize and, and we began to reach out to our community and our, and our nation and our world. And you need to have a goal in your life. You need to have a goal. And here's one of it. You need to uh, discover your unique design for ministry and you need to commit to develop and to use your gifts and your uniqueness and your abilities in serving God and serving others uh, through your church family because that's how he in that's how he designed this thing to operate that you have a gift you've got to discover it you've got to develop it not only the gift but the maturity to use it that's why he talks about Paul talks about it in Corinthians when he talks about the spiritual gifts and he goes through all these gifts and then he goes through and talks about even the fruits of the spirit because he says I don't care if you got enough faith to move a mountain and I don't have care if you got enough faith uh, to, to preach this whole place but if you don't have love you're just making a lot of noise and there's nothing eternal about what you're saying come on somebody amen and and, and so what he's talking about is there has to be a maturity of the, of the spiritual fruit in our life. And you need to discover and develop how God has shaped you and equipped you. Uh, the second one is that you need to select and begin serving in the ministry of this local church. And it, that ex best expresses your gifts. There are some people who are extremely gifted in working with children or, or greeting people or, or working in the coffee bar or, or ushering or hostess or, or any of these things. Or, or working in the garden or working in our missions department or working in the after schools department and working in the preschool and daycare or, or the food pantry or counseling. All of these different ministries, there are people that have shaped and developed and gifted for it. And that's where you need to find where do you serve? Because here's what I want you to know. If you're not serving somewhere, you're not fulfilling your potential in the kingdom of God. Hello, is this thing on? Everybody needs to serve somewhere. The word ministry literally means to serve. That's what it means. Ministry is using whatever God has given us to serve him. Now, we minister in three directions. The first direction that you minister to is you and I minister to the Lord. Uh, in Ezekiel, it says this. This area will be holy. It's set aside for priests who minister to the Lord in the sanctuary. And they will use it for their homes and my temple will be located within them. And, and part of what he's talking about in that day is the priests would minister in the tabernacle and there were certain things that they did and they ministered to the Lord. They, uh, the incense and, and the sacrifices and all of those they ministered. Now you've got to understand that in the New Testament when he talks about priesthood he's not only talking about ministers. The fivefold gift and the priesthood are not the same. In other words when you got saved in the New Covenant every one that's a Christian is a priest. Come on, amen. A, a, a priest is not someone who just made a profession that made it as part of their livelihood, as the as the scripture talks about it. That is part of their calling. That they they uh, supply their family's needs out of it. That's not what he's talking about. The Bible said that all of us who come to Christ have come to the veil. We've been washed in the blood. And that now we, according to First uh, Peter, are kings and priests unto our God. Every person that's been washed in the blood, you have access to God. Before only the high priest priest could go in. Now everybody can come to God. Come on, somebody. Give God a hand clap of praise for that. And you and I have a responsibility to minister to the Lord. And we minister to the Lord in many different ways, but we do it through our worship. We do it when we pray. We do it when we praise and give God's thanksgiving. When we exalt his name, we minister to the Lord. When he gives us an instruction and we obey that instruction, we are ministering to the Lord and ministering for the Lord. It is a vertical ministry. It is a vertical relationship. When we come in here and we worship, I've got to tell you, I, I'm not singing to you, and you're probably glad about that, but I'm not singing to you. I'm singing to the Lord. Because if I was just singing for approval, I would shut my yapper because it ain't that good. Come on, somebody. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm so glad it gets loud in here because it drowns me. I can just sing to my heart's content. Come on, amen? Every now and then I'll see my wife take a step over. Yeah. Throwing her key off or something. Come on, amen? You know what I'm saying? And the reality is our band and our worship leader, they're not singing to you. They're singing to the Lord. 
See, we're all coming into this house and we sing to the Lord. We minister to the Lord. And what they're doing is they're ushering us into the presence of the Lord and leading us into the presence of the Lord. And as a congregation, we're coming into his presence and we're singing to an audience of one. Come on, amen? And so when we worship, if we raise our hands, if we dance, if we, if we cry, if we lay in the floor, whatever we're doing, I want you to know we're not doing it for you, so don't get offended. We're doing it for him. Come on, somebody. And you got to offer up your own worship. Hallelujah. And so we're ministering. It says in Acts chapter 3 and 2, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work unto which I've called them. So we not only minister to the Lord, but when we do our worship and when we pray, we don't only minister to him when we obey, but also when we serve him by obeying what he tells us. When we go and do something in ministry, we are ministering to the Lord through our obedience. In other words, if God leads you to witness to someone or tell someone or, or help someone and you're doing it, you're not only ministering to that person in that moment, you're ministering to the Lord. Come on, amen? So, so when you give somebody some food or, or when you counsel somebody or when you give somebody a ride or when you're loving on somebody, it's not just for them. The Bible says that we're ministering unto the Lord as we minister to our fellow man. Come on, amen? So that's ministry. Now, we also, he calls us to minister not only to him, but to our fellow believers. It says in Ephesians 16 that we read, he makes the whole body fitly joined together as each part does its own special work It helps the other parts grow. In other words, believers serving in the house of God help other believers on this faith journey. I've got to tell you that when we come together and all of this work, uh, ministry is happening while we're here, there's a lot of people that made this happen. Not just a few people that you see with a microphone or on stage, but you've got right now, you've got all kinds of children workers and nursery workers working with children and ministering the word of God to them and loving on them. You've got hundreds of teenagers in the back and they've got a worship team and they've got adults and all kinds of people ministering and, 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 and ministering and teaching the word of God to them. You you got people upstairs ministering to the elementary. You got people working coffee bar, parking cars, and greeting, and hosting, and cleaning, and media, and sound, and all of these things. All of this is ministering to the believers in this place. Come on, amen? And that's what he talks about. We have all come together, and we all have a part to play, and that the whole body becomes healthier, and it grows and is full of love as we all do our part in ministering to one another. God is instructing us that every believer has this part to play in a church and that we need to serve. And if you're not serving, you need to serve somewhere in the body of Christ because it's part of what God will tell you will help you grow. You not only will grow other people, but by serving others, it causes you to grow. Can I get a witness from somebody? Listen to what it says in Hebrews 6 and 10. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. He's saying that when we uh, minister to one another, when we don't feel like it, when we do these kind of things, do not, do not think that God does not take notice. The Bible says that he knows every prayer that we pray, every tear that we shed. There's even angels that are writing down every idle word. Huh? Got tied in here, didn't it? What? Yes, they wrote down your last night's phone conversation. Come on. That's scary, isn't it? Come on, you think the government has got some eavesdropping capability? What do you think God has? Can you imagine in heaven on judgment day? I hope they don't have the video screen. And let's roll the video, Gabriel. Come on, somebody. Y'all better pray. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Get it under the blood, my friend. Get it under the blood. You think Nixon erased tapes. Lord, erase my tapes. Lord, erase my tapes. Erase my tapes. Get rid of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all just meditating on that, ain't you? Thirdly, to non-believers. We not only minister to the Lord, we not only minister to other believers, but we have a call to minister to non-believers. 
And we have to be careful that we don't become uh, so spiritually minded that we don't relate to anybody. Now, I'm not talking about, there's some people who take it to an extreme and, and single people who say, I'm going to date all these heathens because it's evangelistic. <laughs> no. You're messing up. Come on, anybody. But what I'm saying is that as believers, we also have to realize that we have a responsibility that unbelievers around us, that we're not to judge them, we're to love them because all of us were there at one point. And part of the, part of the reason we got saved is someone cared about us. Come on, amen. And that's part of what we're all called to do. We're called to minister to non-believers. Jesus taught on how believers were to reach out and minister to unbelievers. He said this in Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on the stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Every believer, believer without exception, has a responsibility to reach out and minister and love on non-believers and we don't do it and we don't you don't need to do it in an overbearing way come on somebody you you don't need to take hellfire and brimstone to someone you just met come on you don't need to that's not how jesus did it jesus did it in the context of normal life he ministered to them and and would use parables and in 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 conversations just his life would cause them to come to him and ask him questions and come to him in the middle of the night and what must i do to be born again why because there was something different about jesus when you love the unbeliever and you're not judging them but you're not participating in ungodly behavior but you're not uh, judging them you're just there and and you're, and you're a good friend and they see things in your life and they wonder why, why there's certain things that you're not dealing with or there's joy in your life or there's peace in your life or you seem to have a, a, a serenity that they don't have and they're searching for it and that gives you the opportunity to share Jesus with them. It doesn't mean you don't have problems. It just means that you've got the Prince of Peace that helps you through your problems. It doesn't mean that you don't have struggles. It means that I know that it's temporary and that I'm on my way to an eternal destiny and I'm just passing through. Come on, somebody. Amen? And that kind of stuff, the Spirit draws people to you. And then the Spirit will give you the words to say in a way that will connect with them because He knows how to reach people in ways that we don't. So those are three of the areas. And there's three kind of needs that we are called to meet. The first kind of need that we're called to meet is the physical needs. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talking, He says, For I was hungry. And you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever give you, see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and gave you clothes? Or, or, or when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king, Jesus, will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it unto me. Isn't that powerful? You know, we as a church and, and you as an individual, we have a responsibility to do the best we can to try to meet needs. Now, we realize that we can't meet every need of every person and that there are, there are limitations. But I want you to know that there's some believers in some churches believe that uh, they're not really called to, to meet the needs of people, that they're not called to do that. But every believer is called to some extent to meet the needs of, believe, of unbelievers and believers. We are called to meet the physical needs of the people around us. And I know we can't do everything, but that's why we try to do things. And as a body and as part of Christ Central, you are part of those things. Our food pantry and feeding the hungry and, and sending medicines overseas and, and trying to do those things and giving to the Christian Service Center and giving to the Senior Enrichment Center and, and giving scholarships to our to the elderly and, and those who can't pay for it, helping them to do that. And, and uh, the youth program 
program and the after school programs and helping families when they can't financially do it, us absorbing those costs and making a way to do it and the numerous prisons that we're in every week, the four and five prisons that our elders and ministers go in and minister every week and all of those things is fulfilling the great commandment and commission when we go out because every week you're a part of a church that's going to go overseas, that's going to feed the hungry this week, that's going into the prisons this week, that's preaching the gospel around the world this week, that's ministering to the the fatherless and ministering to the elderly. Is anybody hearing me? Amen. See, that's what I love about what God's doing here is we're fulfilling and manifesting the kingdom because the people came together with a vision to make a difference and the kingdom of God is being manifested in this place and there's people being touched with their physical needs because you and others say, I want to make a difference in the world today. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. We know that, that, that we can't meet every need, so, but we try to do everything that we can. Uh, that's why the team's going to San Pedro Sula. That's why we have the three children's homes with 120, 130 children and all those things is because we want to fulfill the promises of the Word of God. And the king will say... I tell you the truth, you did it to, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it unto me. That's going to be a great day, isn't it? When Jesus looks at you and he tells you, well done, when you did these things and when you ministered the gospel and when you helped somebody that was hungry and when you went and did that, I remember it and you didn't just do it to them, you did it to me. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'll shout right now. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Isn't that going to be awesome? We not only meet people's physical needs, but we, have, we are called to meet people's emotional needs. And here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14. We exhort, this is King James first. We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, and support the weak, and be patient toward all men. Feeble-minded means uh, faint-hearted and emotionally weak. When you read the, the New Living Translation, it gives a little more light on some of the things. It says this, Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Warn those who are lazy. <coughs> Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to them, each other, and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said and hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of of evil. I, I want to just kind of, let me, let me just kind of give you the highlights there. Believers warn other believers who are lazy to not be lazy. Consider yourself warned. <laughs> Consider yourself warned. If you're not serving, I'm not going to call you lazy. Let it speak for itself. Come on, somebody. The Bible said warn. Why? Why does he say to warn lazy people? Because when you stand before God, there is a judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Now, judgment seat of Christ is different than the white throne judgment, which is the sinner's. Did you know that you can be a Christian and that you can go to heaven and that you can get there and still stand at the judgment seat of Christ and not receive any rewards and not receive and your ranking and the Bible talks about positioning in heaven is based on your faithfulness here on earth? Come on, somebody. See, God may have called you and designed you to walk in as a general and walk in and He wants to give you all of these things to, to rule and reign with Him according to Scripture and Revelation. And it's based not only on your giftedness, but also the purpose that He designed you with and the faithful faithfulness with which you serve. And if you don't serve Him and you look for the easy way, the Bible said that when you get there, no matter if you've done a few things and it wasn't done for the right motive, it can burn up and you'll just barely get in and you skivvies. That's the Greek, if y'all didn't know that. That's a, that means you don't take nothing with you. Come on, amen? 
He said, but those who have served faithfully, he said that great is your reward. Come on, somebody. In other words, that he's going to entrust you to rule and reign with him because you've been faithful in serving here. And because of that, he is going. So he says, don't be lazy in the things of God. I know that isn't popular, but that's true. Amen. Will somebody give me an amen on that? Thank you. Thank you so much. I had, to, I had to pull that out of you. All right. So we have to warn believers. Now, we also have to encourage and counsel and inspire those who are emotionally weak. Now, he's talking about those who have emotional issues, those who are struggling all the time and, and stress and anxiety and pressures. And he talks about he doesn't want you to stay that way. He wants you to grow and people to minister to you to be to grow stronger. In other words, whatever you're dealing with, you are not a victim to that for the rest of your life. If you're depressed, you don't have to keep that the rest of your life. If you deal with anxiety or fear, you don't have to live with that. that. The Bible says that we minister to you, but you have to have a hunger to want to change. you got to be careful that you don't become codependent, that you emotionally need someone to come always and say, what's going on with you? Or what is wrong with you? And you get dependent on people's sympathy. That's not what God wants for you. God wants you to get delivered from it, get strong enough that then you're strong enough to minister to somebody else that is weak. It's okay that you're weak at one time, but don't stay there. Is anybody hearing what I'm talking about? They say right now that, that in, our, in our culture that there's more people on medications to deal with anxieties and stresses. And listen, I realize those are real, but all I'm trying to tell you is wherever you are, God can deliver you and bring you out of it. He can heal you. Just like he can heal your body, he can heal your mind. He can heal you from that, that stress and that worry. Can I get a witness from somebody? He also says, uh, and he's talking about, take tender care of those who are sick. Minister to those who are sick in body. That's part of what we're called. He says also, be patient with everybody. I'm going to open the altars up right now. <laughs> be patient with everybody. You know, I, he had me till everybody. You know, and he didn't even say be patient with 99.9%. Everybody. That person... That gets on your last nerve. Come on, get, I want you to, you got the picture of them right now? You got to be patient with that person. You, you got to be, is that, isn't that something? And that takes maturity. Be patient with everybody. Listen to this. Always do good, even when you're done wrong. In other words, there's no clause in there to get even. God didn't even slip in a get even clause. Always do good. He also said, always be joyful. Some of y'all want to leave and come back in? <laughs> always be positive. How you doing tonight? Oh, the devil's got me in a stronghold. Pastor, I can't even look up. I think he's got me in a figure four right now. <laughs> Like, don't let him see you sweat, dog. Don't let him see you sweat. You come in here, man. You ask me. I don't care. Listen, it may be horrible, but you tell you we're going to hear me? Another day in paradise, baby. Another day in paradise. Why? Because I'm not going to let give him the satisfaction. I may be going through it, but I'm coming through it. Do you hear me? Today is a day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, somebody. He's been good to us. I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm on my way to heaven. It's a good day in the kingdom. Come on. Hallelujah. Just give him a, about 30 seconds of praise. Just, just give him. We love you. You're good. You're holy. You're righteous. We praise you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. My Lord, be positive. Always be joyful. Be positive. And here's the key to it. Never stop praying. Praying without ceasing. That means you always have a spirit of prayer and always. It says be thankful in everything. Not thankful for everything. You don't have to be thankful for that ticket you got. First of all, you get out and that, that policeman stop you and you start thanking him, thanking him. He'll probably get you for, for drunken driving. I know you're crazy. Get in this back of this car. 
He's saying not for everything, but in everything. In other words, keep a thankful spirit no matter what happens. Be thankful for the good things and be thankful for God. It says don't or do not quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Not only when he wants to move on you. Not when you, when you feel the Spirit moving on you. Don't quench it. If he moves on you to witness to someone, and you get, don't, don't quench it. If he moves on you in here to worship, don't quench it. If he moves on you to, to come to the altar, don't, don't quench it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is doing things for a reason. And that reason, I promise you, is to bless you and not to hurt you. Amen. To use you for the kingdom and to, to use your life for a, a bigger blessing than you could ever amount. So don't quench the, the Holy Spirit. It says, do not scoff or doubt prophecies. In other words, if someone gives you a word, or, or, or prophecies is also when I'm preaching and the Holy Spirit will quicken you with a word and something, don't, oh, that's not for me, or don't scoff at that, but you receive that, or someone gives you a word, but test it. In other words, it doesn't mean that you just receive it and you act upon it. The Bible said, try the spirits, because not everybody who says they're a prophet is a prophet. You see, there's a lot of parking lot prophets that will mess you up. Come on, amen? They'll catch you in the parking lot and give you, I got a word for you. Come on, is anybody hearing me? There's a lot of frustrated people. And they're looking for someone that they can speak into without going through proper protocols. See, proper protocols is we believe in the word from the Lord, but we believe that people need to be accountable to leadership that way we know that they are people of integrity and character. But when people try to go around leadership and always trying to circumvent, you better watch them. The Bible talks about them. They, they have a deceiving in, in spirits. And it talks about they'll even have doctrines of devils that will snare people and pull them out. There's a lot of people and a lot of ministers who do not have enough anointing to, to build a church or for God. They're not walking in the, in the word of God, so they're not building a church. So they hang around a church that's being built trying to siphon off people who are immature to deceive them. I'm preaching better than you're shouting right now. but So you better watch the word, don't scoff it, but the Bible said test it. That's why I tell you, when I preach something, you go check it out. You check out the word of God. We are all, listen, we're all growing in our faith, and you need to get the word of God, and you need to have it in your own spirit that you can hear when something's right, and when something doesn't sound right, you check it out and try that spirit. Is that true? Because the Bible said we have to be workmen studying to show ourselves approved. Come on, Amen. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Thirdly, we also meet spiritual needs of people. The world and all humanity has this great need of being restored. The world is lost. The world is in a place of, uh, of separation from God and depravity. And, and they're in the kingdom of darkness. This world, the Bible talks about even in the end times, that there will be a gross darkness, a thicker blanket of darkness, more deception and people being deceived even in greater levels. And, and we have to realize we're living in that. But the Bible talks about that Jesus died for the people and that for all the world and that we have a responsibility to begin to minister to those who are spiritually dead to declare the good news. He gave us a mission and a commission and that it is not just Jesus' job to do it. It's not just the Holy Spirit's job to do it. It's not just ministers' jobs to do it. It is your job to also do it. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. And we are Christ's ambassadors and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Come on, amen? 
In other words, that's all of our responsibilities is to reach out and for God to use us because we have an assignment of reconciliation. I'm going to do, uh, because this is going to be a continuing series, I'm going to give you three things real quick about the purpose of ministry and then we're out of here. God wants us to use and help grow the church and everyone in here has a responsibility to grow in capacity and level. You and we have been created for ministry. You were created for ministry. Not just to go to church, but you have been created for ministry. Ephesians 2 and 9 says salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about salvation, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, and so can we do the good things that he planned for us a long time ago. Before we were born, God laid out some things in our life, purpose and destiny, and then created us for it, and then when we were born, we are to walk in it. David knew that, and David, uh, through the, uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned it in Psalms 139 when he said, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born, and every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. God created us for a relationship with him before you were ever born. You were created not for hell, but for God. I want you to know that you were created for a relationship with God. You were created with a divine purpose in, li- in mind. Even though you were born into sin, and even though you were born into a fallen world, you were not born here to, to go to hell and to be lost. God birthed you into this earth to save you and redeem you, and then to use you to help bring people to Christ and save people through the glorious message of Jesus Christ. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. You've not only been created for ministry, but you've been saved for ministry. You have been saved for ministry. It says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but he's given us power and love and self-discipline. So never, somebody say never. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though he said I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time. To show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. He broke the power of death and he illuminated the way to life in in immortality through the good news. And God chose me, he said, to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. Paul was communicating that God had saved them and was using their life as a testimony of his goodness that you were not only created for his glory, but you were saved to be a minister of the gospel and evidence of his love and his mercy and what he could do with a redeemed life. Come on, the reason we are here is not because we all of a sudden had a change of mind or because all of a sudden we just came to ourselves. Somewhere along the line, God in his infinite mercy and wisdom found us in the middle of our sin and reached way down in our brokenness and said, I love you and brought us out of it. And he gave us a a new hope and, and eternal life. And then he says, I want to use you as an example of what I can do for anyone. So no matter who you are or where you came from there is hope in Jesus Christ he is a redeemer you were not created to die and go to hell he saves you for a purpose and a destiny come on amen hallelujah and lastly and you can stand with me and you can come to the keyboard and help me land this plane we have been all called into ministry listen to what first Peter says before we go it says But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priest. You're a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you had no identity and as a people, but now... 
you are God's people. Once you had no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. You see, I don't know how long it has been in your life. But years and years ago, God brought me out of darkness. He brought me out of bondage. Come on, out of partying and drugs. You say, well, I never did that. Listen, you were bound by something. Thoughts. Lust. He brought us all out of sin because the Bible talks about how sin had dominion over all of us. And the, when God saves us, He calls us out of that darkness into His light. We were created for purpose and ministry. We were created for destiny. Then He redeems us, saves our soul, places within us a new spirit. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Literally, that word, that, that, that translation means a new creation in Christ Jesus. A new creature. In other words, we're not even the same kind of creature anymore because now our spirit man is alive. He says that when you, when you begin to walk in this newness of life, I've called you out of destruction and death and bondage. You were on your way to hell, but I called you out of that death. You're on your way to no hopes and no dreams and separated from God for all eternity. And, and He called you, pulled you and me out. But then He did pulled us out. He, he didn't just pull us out of bondage. He didn't just pull us out of slavery. He pulled us in and called us into a sonship. He calls us kings. I like the sound of that. King Lonnie. He is king. The Bible says every one of us becomes kings. You say, but he's the king. That's why the scripture calls him the king of kings. In a nation of kings who've been called out. He stands as the king that all these kings represent. And, and, and he represents us. He is also the high priest in heaven. In other words, priesthood. They would go to God for man. And they would bring the sacrifice, the blood, into the holy place. And then they would come from God and they would come out to man. They were the mediator. You see, when you were created, in Genesis, he said, I've given you dominion. We lost it. Jesus regained it. He gave us dominion. We lost our sonship and we became slaves, but he redeemed us and made us sons again. We lost our royalty with God and, and he regained our royalty. He said, you're no longer slaves to sin, but you're sons and daughters of the Most High God. You didn't just barely get out of, of hell, but now you are kings and priests and royalty. And you're a priest. You see, right now we're to take dominion back. That's why we bind things in prayer and loose things in our worship. And why? Because we are kings and priests unto God. See, when we pray, our prayers go to heaven and our high priest goes to the Father with them. <laughs> oh, but then he wants a, a will for the earth. And, and so not only do we have a representation in heaven because of God, he is a man. We have a man. Christ Jesus, who represents us to God, who knows and is touched by the feelings of our infirmity, and yet he had no sin, so he's fit to come into God's presence for us and to plead our case and our mortality and our humanity. But then we in the earth are his ambassadors, it says. We are his representatives. We are kings representing a king. We are a priest representing a high priest. 
And where he goes to God for us, we go to humanity for him. That's why we can pray over the sick and they can be healed. Because we're not of this earth. Our power and authority comes from God. We are connected because we are men, but we are been changed because we are spirit. <laughs> he said, take back your authority. The enemy has no place. Put him under your feet. You have more power than him because I live within you. Whatever you bind is going to be bound and whatever you loose will be loosed. And don't live your life in weakness and immaturity, but grow into the statue of Christ. And when Jesus walked into a place, the Spirit of God came in and the demons fell and trembled and people got set free and lives were changed. And you and I, the same power he walked in, he's given it to us. But we must be mature and hungry for spiritual things to operate in the kingdom. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I know that tonight is a teaching. But maybe you're here and you're struggling in somewhere area of your life. You're not saved or you feel disconnected and you know that you're not in a right relationship with God and you're just struggling. We're not here to judge anyone. We, we've all got problems. But we're here to tell you that He loves you. He cares for you and He, he died that you don't have to live in bondage or pain or brokenness. You can have eternal life through Christ. With nobody looking around and you just say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I need Christ in my life. Yes, sir. God bless you, sir. Amen, amen. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes. God bless you, ma'am. Is there another? Yes. Come on, raise them. Yes. Amen. God Hallelujah. bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. Hallelujah. Let's all pray together right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. I know you created me and that you love me. Right now, I ask you to save me, to forgive me of every sin. I confess it to you. From this moment forward, I just want to, I want to follow you. Come into my life. Change me that I may please you. I ask these things in Christ's name. For those who prayed that, you need to see someone before you leave. Just share that with them. For the believers that, I've, that are here tonight, maybe... As I've been talking about maturity, you realize that maybe you're dealing with immaturity or laziness or unforgiveness or judgment or lack of joy. I mean, all of those things that we talked about. And you say, Pastor, I want to be a mature son. I want to be a mature daughter of God. I want to, I want to be that king and that priest unto my God. I want to serve God by loving people. I want to serve God by changing the atmospheres of the places I go. And I just need to grow, and, and I'm willing to grow. If that's you, just raise your hand and hands all over. Father, we come to you tonight on this Wednesday night, this Bible study, thanking you for the goodness of your grace and mercy. Lord, we are just people on a journey of life. Thank you for being with us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to have a hunger for you. Lord, we're in this world, and Father, Lord, we have so many friends and families that we love and we care about, and Lord, I know that sometimes, Father, when we talk about these things to those who haven't been redeemed, it seems so weird. But Father, you've said, Father, that sometimes the preaching is foolishness to those who aren't saved because they don't understand this dynamic but Father, I pray that they will understand it and receive it before they step from this life to the next. Because in that moment, Father, they're going to see the reality of everything I've said. In that moment, they're going to see the reality that this is not crazy. This is really the, this is really the reality. That there is a life after this. And that, Lord, we, were, we will never die. So, Father, I just pray that you'll renew us and strengthen us. And give us a hunger to grow and mature.
we praise you tonight.